Hey all and welcome back to another tutorial packed full of tips, tricks, techniques and some awesome animations. This is by no means a quick tutorial, so grab a large cup of coffee, sit back and relax while I step you through the creation of this fantastic diorama. The first thing we need to build is the corner store. This is the Roscoe store from Branchline. It's a great kit, even a novice would have no trouble putting it together. And there aren't many parts to the kit. The first step with any wooden kit is to prime the parts. I use Vallejo primer, but any good primer paint will do. Just remember to prime both sides of the wood to limit the amount of warping. If it starts to warp while painting, just give it some time to dry and the parts will usually straighten out. When it comes to assembling the building, you'll want a good glue a sharp hobby knife, and some sandpaper as a minimum. Having a couple of squares and machinist blocks will help in keeping everything nice and square. Laser cut kits like this usually require very little sanding. I do however make sure to dry fit each piece before gluing, just to make sure each piece fits perfectly together. The glue of choice for me is Helmar Super Tack Glue mainly because it's strong and dries very fast. You can see here how quickly it grabs. I give each wall a couple of minutes to dry before moving on to the next piece. Before you know it, the main structure will be complete. In areas hidden from view, I add a little extra glue to help reinforce the building. Lastly, I add the roof to ensure everything fits properly before painting. The initial color I chose for the walls was the scale modeler's supply sand, which is conveniently shaken up in my recently constructed paint shaker. However, this is not the final color of the building. After applying the paint, I wasn't really happy with the final color, so while the camera was off, I applied a second coat using light stone, also from the scale modeler's supply. The windows and doors couldn't be easier to assemble. The peel and stick works exceptionally well and makes building them a breeze. Even though there was nearly 20 windows, the process was over very fast. I ended up choosing Vallejo Green Brown for the windows and doors. It was a nice contrast to the rest of the building and seems to be a quite a common colour scheme, especially around railways. To highlight the detail on each window frame, I gave them a light dry brushing using Vallejo Off-White. It helps give them the look of age and a faded appearance. Now we can add the window glazing, which simply presses onto the back of the frame. A footprint of the building is made using some 1.5mm plywood. This piece will be used later as a base when installing the finished building into the final scene. Once it has been measured and cut, I put it aside until I'm ready to start on the scenery. The windows and trim are all pressed into position, taking advantage of the peel and stick feature. The building as it comes is supplied with a shingled roof. However, to give the building a more Australian feel, I'm using corrugated iron instead. To make the sheets of corrugated iron, I'm using the Brunel Hobbies Corrugated Iron Maker, along with some of their thick tin foil sheets. The foil is first smoothed out by gently pressing and dragging the back of my fingernail across the foil. Next, the sheet is cut to the size I want for each corrugated panel. Now with the foil lined up on the corrugated maker base, very lightly pass the top handle across the foil. Only use a very light pressure and make multiple passes until the corrugations appear. If you press too hard on the first pass, you'll end up tearing a hole into the foil. The sheet is then flipped over, aligned with the grooves, and the handle is dragged along the back of the sheet as well to further emboss the foil with the corrugations. Doing this also helps straighten out any warping. To stick the foil to the roof, I'm using 3M Super 77 spray adhesive. I've tried a number of different spray adhesives, but for this job, the Super 77 certainly works the best. Now it's just a matter of lining up the sheets onto the roof sections and pressing them down. Just remember to only apply a light pressure when pressing them down to avoid ruining the corrugations in the foil. Once the first sheet is on, 
you'll need to align the grooves of the following sheets so they all line up. A small amount of spray adhesive is also sprayed onto the back of the foil sheets as well so they all stick to each other on the overlapping areas. Any excess foil is cut away. Obviously it's too shiny right now, but a coat of paint will soon fix that. I've decided to paint the roof a nice oxide red. I ended up using two parts Vallejo German Red Brown Primer and one part of White Primer with some Vallejo Thinners. Paint and foil don't really go together all that well and it's extremely easy to scratch away the paint. To help prevent unwanted scratches, the roof gets two thin coats of Tester's Dull Coat. This not only helps protect the paint, but it also provides a nice matte surface for applying the weathering effects later. The interior of the shop needs floors, so with some 0.5mm styrene, I cut and sanded sections to act as floors. To detail the floor, some wood textures found online are printed and glued down. Then each floor section is glued into the building. Because I'm not going to be detailing the entire inside of the building, I hide the interiors by gluing windows and curtains that were also printed from images online. Some of the blinds are left slightly open, however there is another image of an interior also attached to the window, giving the illusion that there is something else inside. Shop interiors are added using random images found on Google. They don't have to be perfect, but you do want to try to find images with a good perspective. Here is an example of a good image for the back wall. It implies the back of the shop is much further back than it actually is. And here is one that will work well on the side wall. Once you have a selection of images that will work, they are copied and scaled down accordingly, so they look appropriate to the scale you'll be working in. For me, that's HO scale. Each photo is measured and cut to fit perfectly on each wall. Once they are perfectly fit, the image is glued onto the wall with some white glue. Some of the images are first glued to foam board to add a more three-dimensional effect. Branch Line also have an interiors kit. It's technically designed for the Dubois store kit, however the parts work for just about any interior. I find the shelves are much easier to paint while they are still in the laser cut sheet. I just add a random colour to signify different products. Nothing too fancy, just enough to sell the illusion. Piecing them together is straightforward and when they are ready they are glued into the interior of the store. The kit has tables, chairs, shelves, a shop counter and some restaurant booths which I didn't use. We've put all this effort into detailing the interior, we need to light it up so people can see it. Some micro LEDs are wired in parallel and glued onto a makeshift roof. The same is basically done for the two smaller shops on each side as well. Before attaching the shop front, some small posters and signs get glued to the windows. I also want to have a large painted sign on the top of the front facade. To do this I had to remove some of the peel and stick detailing. The sign is printed onto tissue paper, but first it will need to be taped to some regular printer paper so that it can make it through the printer. The image for the sign was made in Photoshop and scaled down so it would fit perfectly in the space and then printed. Once the sign has been trimmed so that it will fit perfectly, I spray the back of the tissue paper with Super 77 spray. Just like the foil roof, I found the Super 77 spray works best for this particular technique. It's important to get the sign perfectly lined up. Just take your time. The spray adhesive has a long working time so there's no rush. Once the top corners are down, I use a paintbrush to press the tissue paper into the weatherboards, working from the top and making my way down the sign while dragging the brush along the boards.
I use the back of the tweezer to further press the tissue paper into the grooves. I only press down very lightly as you don't want to accidentally tear the tissue paper. Finally, any imperfections are covered up with paint. We can't have an empty shop, so the last thing to add are some people. And now the shop front can be attached. The rock foundations are added and the last bits of green trim are installed as well. The roof is glued down with super tack glue, but before you do this, I want to be sure everything inside the shop is just how we want it because we are essentially sealing everything inside once the roof is glued down. To add the roof capping, I used some 0.8mm styrene rod along each peak. Once that was down, a 0.25 by 1.5mm strip was butted up against the 0.8mm rod. Additional roof details like this evaporative air conditioner, an aerial and a kitchen vent was 3D printed, painted and glued onto the roof. All of the 3D printed files I used in this project are free to download from my website if you too want to make a building like this. Rust effects are applied to the capping using Vallejo rust and a sponge. And further rust and streaking effects on the roof corrugations are done with MIG oil brushes. This is the first project I've used these on and they are a breeze to use and very clean. There is really no mess or no wastage. Simply use the attached brush and add oil in the desired location and don't worry if you put too much on because it's very easy to remove. Then with a brush dipped in the MIG enamel odorless thinners, gently press the brush over the oil and drag down in the direction you want the streak to appear. Extra cabling detail is added to the aerial with some copper coloured Easy Line. It's quite fiddly but the Easy Line adheres very fast with super glue and after a further minute to cure the excess line is trimmed away. To finish off the building I give it a dusting of medium earth coloured weathering powder. I focus on areas around the base of the building where dirt and grime may be kicked up from the ground as well as under the roof overhang where dust might collect and to add a touch of shading. A small amount of rust coloured powder is added to the roof as well. That's pretty well it for building the corner store. Now we can move on to actually creating the base and building up the terrain on the diorama. For that I'm using the tried and true extruded polystyrene. The basic layout of the diorama is drawn onto the foam and excess foam is removed using a hot wire foam cutter. I've been using the hot wire foam factory tools quite a lot recently, but for this job I decided to give my homemade hot wire foam cutter a run. Whenever I work with foam, I always add a sturdy frame to help prevent warping over time. A simple frame made from pine is measured and cut. I used polyurethane glue to glue the foam to the wood frame and screws are added for a good measure and once it's all done, I add clamps in appropriate spots until the glue cures. While the glue is curing, I also weigh down the foam to prevent it from moving. For this back road corner street, I simply used two HO scale vehicles to get a rough road width. To make the surface of the road, I have to consider how the magna rail system will work. I chose to use 0.9mm thick sheet of plastic from the local office supply store. The good thing about the plastic being transparent is that I can easily transfer the road I drew onto the foam onto the sheet of plastic ready to be cut. And this stuff was really easy to cut with a hobby knife. Now here's where the fun starts. The magna rail system is a way of getting cars to operate on your layout. The basic starter kit has everything you need to get a small loop of road animated but if you want to do a larger area, you can order additional sections as needed. The instructions are very straightforward. Each part comes on a sprue and once they have been removed and the excess flashing removed, you're ready to start assembly. Because I'm working directly on foam, I had to make a few modifications to how the track gets installed. It's designed to be screwed onto a wood base However, I decided to remove the screw tabs from the sections of track 
and instead embedded them into the foam. All the components that form the track are traced onto the foam surface and with the center of each lane marked, I trace the track onto the foam working along until it connects in both directions. I added a little bit of an overshoot on the corners so the larger vehicles could get around without sideswiping any pedestrians standing on the corner. To carve out the groove for the track, I'm using a Dremel with a router attachment. The depth is set, so once the MagnaRail track is installed, it will sit perfectly flush with the surface of the foam. Now it's just a matter of following the lines traced earlier. Starting from one end, I lower each component into the foam and gradually connect additional sections of track until I reach the other end. You can see here that one side of the track just so happened to match up perfectly with the turning loop. However, the other side didn't quite match up perfectly. It was easy enough to trim away the extra length and sand it back to a perfect fit. The wiring components consisted of an on-off switch, a switch to reverse the direction of track, a speed controller to speed up or slow down the vehicles, and a power socket and a battery. It can also be powered with a 12 volt power supply as well. I wired everything together so it can be accessed from the front of the diorama. Once it's all connected, I give it a quick test just to make sure it's all working. The links are easy enough to connect together. Small magnets are pressed into the links at the desired locations. Just make sure the polarity of the magnets are around the right way. I had a small Santa on a bicycle that had the magnets already attached, so I used that as a guide to make sure I was being consistent with getting the polarity the right way around as I installed the magnets. With the magnets installed, I can start placing the links onto the track. When it comes to getting the links to join up perfectly, you may need to swap out some longer links for shorter links or vice versa until you get a perfect length. There should be very minimal slack once it's all connected. Before gluing the road, I make sure to use a wire brush to roughen up the surface of the foam. And I also lightly sand the underside of the road so that the glue will be able to hold the road down firmly. I used five minute epoxy to glue the road to the foam. However, this probably wasn't a great idea. It did work in the end. However, the epoxy cured very fast, which meant I had to rush to get the road down in time. The road surface was flexible enough to allow me to bend it up and work in sections at a time. However, in future, I'll try to find a glue that has a much longer working time to make the job a little easier. Just be very careful that you don't accidentally glue the road mechanism. Any excess glue is removed from the edges so that there is nothing in the way when it's time to add the guttering. Now is probably a good time to talk about getting cars moving. These metal sliders have a small arm that is bent up and two spots for the magnets. To enable the small arm to connect to the vehicle, I added a small piece of brass rod just big enough so the arm on the slider could fit into it. Magnets were glued to the slider whilst it was sitting on the road over a magnet. This way I can be sure the polarity is the correct way around and that's it. You'll also want to make sure the wheels on whatever vehicle you're using turn freely. That's the great thing about this type of car system. You can pretty well use any type of vehicle you have and get it working on the layout. It's especially useful for those working on smaller scales like N scale. To get a good realistic looking gutter, I decided to 3D print them. These two are available on my website if you wish to download some for yourself. For the sidewalk, I'm using 3mm thick PVC board. It's basically a very dense foam, but is still easy to cut with a hobby knife. It's cut to match the shape of the road, and then the 3D printed gutters are glued to the edges. The gutters were designed to be the exact same height as the PVC foam board and also take into account the thickness of the plastic sheet used for the road surface. 
To judge the width of the footpath, I placed the building in its position and chose a width that looked about right. Then the excess PVC is cut away, leaving behind only the sections of footpath that I wanted. As I work along, I continuously test different components, like the building, just to make sure I'm not making any big or obvious mistakes. To add a bit of visual interest, I decided to cut away some of the foam landform to create a stormwater drain. This proved a little tougher than expected due to the thick pine frame, however once I had the contours of the drain marked out onto the side of the wood frame and the electronics masked so they don't get covered in sawdust, I used the jigsaw to remove the wood. The rest of the foam was cut away with a knife and the Dremel with a sanding drum was used to smooth the edges of the wood and have it blend in nicely with the rest of the diorama. As with most of my dioramas, the landform is built up using Sculptor Mold. I'm actually using a modeling mix from Officeworks, however it's basically the same stuff with very similar properties. It's mixed with water to make a thick paste and applied over the foam. I work it with my fingers to get the desired contours. The storm water drains are pressed into position and the plaster is continuously worked and smoothed as it starts to harden. To build up the rest of the landforms on the diorama, I first finished the building slab that will sit next door to the corner store so that I will have a good idea of where I do and don't want small hills. It's made using the same 3mm PVC board that was used for the footpaths. Now that I know exactly where all the structures will be situated, I can finish the rest of the landforming. Using a scrap piece of foam board helps allow me to build up the plaster right up to the edge of the footpath without actually having it in place. A Dremel was used to create the transition from the footpath to the road. It's really easy to make a mistake here, so I set the Dremel to a low RPM and only apply a very light pressure as the cutting is slowly sanded away. The expansion joints on the footpath are made using a pin and a ruler. The foam is quite hard, but it's also soft enough to create the joints by pressing the pin firmly and dragging it to create the line. It's hard to see on camera, but the lines are definitely there, and once we apply the weathering, they will show up nicely. The base color is Woodland Scenics Concrete applied through the airbrush. It's quite a thick paint, so you'll need to thin it down quite a lot. The textured look is made using a sponge. The first color applied is a mix of the concrete and the black to create a nice warm gray. Only a small amount of paint is needed on the sponge, a bit like adding rust effects. You just want small individual speckles to be transferred from the sponge onto the footpath. Next, using the exact same technique, I apply some Vallejo Off-White. For the weathered look, I apply an oil wash with MIG oil brushes and a final blending with Vallejo Basalt Grey. The oil gets thinned down with the odorless thinners. Only a small amount of oil paint is needed and it will need continuous mixing as you go because the oil pigment settles to the bottom quite fast. The mixture is liberally painted over the entire footpath and I deliberately allow some areas of heavier application and areas of lighter application so there is a subtle variation in colour along the footpath. Lightly dabbing it with the paper towel helps remove any excess but it also helps give a mottled look and an older weathered footpath. To tone down the colour and give it an older greyer appearance, the entire footpath is lightly airbrushed with Vallejo Basalt Grey. Just ensure to do this in very thin coats because it's easy to cover all the hard work we just did. I decided to paint the gutters with pale grey blue, however in hindsight I probably would have just left them the same colour as the footpath if I was to do this over again. Now it's time to paint the road. Rust-Oleum Flat Grey Primer and Satin Heirloom White is the colours of choice 
but it will work with a range of other colors. It can be a bit messy, so make sure to cover anything in the vicinity to protect it from paint. The foam around the road will not take spray paint well, so it gets masked to prevent it from melting away. The grey is the base coat and it gets applied over the entire road surface. The white is the texture layer, so it is applied from quite a distance away. It leaves a speckled texture on the road surface. I'm basically just dusting the road with this colour. Because it's applied from a distance away, some of the paint will dry before sticking to the road. This dry, dusty layer is wiped away before the next step. Weathering the road is basically the same technique we used on the footpath. Just be aware that the thinners will soften the Rust-Oleum paint layer, so avoid spending too long in one spot with the paintbrush. I keep moving along the road applying the wash, leaving heavier spots and lighter spots as we did on the footpath. To change the colour tone of the road, I used Vallejo Dark Sea Grey. It's a very thin layer of paint, being sure not to obscure the details underneath. Road markings are painted onto the road surface. It takes time to do all the masking, but in the end once you finish, it will make a huge difference and is definitely worth the time and effort. Masking is really important. Remember to take your time and ensure everything is masked properly to avoid getting paint where it's not wanted. When mixing the paint, try to avoid thinning it too much. You don't want the paint to remain runny as it gets applied, otherwise you'll find the paint will soak under the masking tape. Road repair patches are simply added with a paper template and a sponge. I find the Woodland Scenics asphalt colour is a good fresh tarmac colour. I make sure to create a few templates of different shapes to avoid having it look unrealistic when multiple patches are close to each other. To weather the lanes of the road, a light dusting of a dark earth pigment is applied. With this powder, a little goes a long way. Only a light application is needed to make a big difference. Road cracks are drawn on with a felt tip pen. And by using a pencil, I can add cracking to the painted lines and you can also simulate faded paint using the pencil as well. Now that the road is complete, I seal everything down with three coats of Tester's Dull Coat. The reason it gets sealed with three coats of Dull Coat and no less is because the MagnaRail system uses small sliders that are dragged over the road surface. To prevent the paint from being scratched away, it needs a good layer of protection and so far the Dull Coat has worked well. A brown base colour is painted over anywhere dirt will be applied. I started with raw sienna but added some black to darken it and a cream colour to make it an earthy grey colour. I didn't really need to paint right up to the road here, but just in case there were any gaps in the footpath, I decided to cover all of the surface area with the paint. The footpath gets glued using 5 minute epoxy, being careful not to get it on the road. The cement construction slab, as well as the corner store plywood base, are glued down as well. The dirt texture I use is real dirt scooped up from outside. The dirt alone is too dark, some, some Davco Cornsick grout from Bunnings is added. I have a couple of different grades of dirt, one a very fine grade and a coarse grade for rough textured terrain. Once again, before sprinkling dirt all over the place, I mask any areas like the footpath and the road so dirt doesn't obscure them. The dirt has a hard time sticking to the hills, so to keep the dirt on the slopes I painted a diluted mixture of Mod Podge mat with water. Now when I sprinkle the larger dirt texture over the area, the larger rocks are able to stay on the edge of the slope without piling up at the bottom. Then on top of the coarse layer, I apply the fine dirt texture using an old spray can lid and a stocking. This helps blend in the larger rocks so they don't look like they are sitting up high on top of the ground 
but rather they are protruding out from the ground while still embedded in the dirt. To fix all this down, I use isopropyl alcohol and my scenic glue mixture, which is made using one part Mod Podge mat, three parts water, and a few drops of dish soap. The alcohol is first applied to wet down the dirt. Once it's reasonably soaked, I apply the glue. The alcohol helps the glue soak into the dirt layer better, and it helps prevent the glue from beading up on top of the dirt layer. Once the area has been glued, I make sure to promptly remove the masking off the road. Sometimes you'll find white patches where the glue and alcohol has reacted with the dull coat. This can be fixed by misting alcohol over the white area, and it will clear the white patches. Now it's just left to dry overnight. After the dirt has dried, I wasn't entirely happy with the final colour. It was just a little bit darker than I wanted, so I applied a lighter dirt mixture over the top in selected areas especially around the work site where there would be a lot more movement and action. After the excess is removed from the road using a brush, I mask only the edges of the road and use some paper for a barrier so that as the alcohol and glue is applied, it will not get on the road surface. It was a much thinner layer of dirt, so a lighter application of glue was all that was needed to fix this layer down. The road shoulders were detailed with Woodland Scenic's fine grey gravel. It's similar to ballast, but much finer, and does a great job for adding the gravel commonly seen along the edges of roads. It's also great for creating gravel roads and driveways. It gets fixed in a similar way to fixing ballast by first applying the alcohol, and then applying the glue using an eyedropper. Now for the fun transformation, applying static grass. For this I'm using the new Woodland Scenics Static King, and some of their 2, 4 and 7mm static grasses. I mostly use a 50-50 mixture of 7mm light green and 7mm medium green grass, but I also add a small amount of 4mm grass as well using the same colour. It's super easy to use static grass. Once the applicator is ready with the hopper full of the desired grass colour, I simply apply the static grass glue in spots where I want the grass applied and spread the glue out with a paintbrush. The glue tends to dry quite fast, so I only work in small, manageable areas at a time. Next, it's just a matter of turning the applicator on, touching the grounding wire close to where you are applying the static grass, and shake away. It's amazing that just a very small amount of static grass on a model can make a huge difference in the overall appearance. Once the area has been grassed, the excess is vacuumed up with a piece of stocking over the end, so we can collect the grass and use it on other sections of the diorama. The static king can be used by connecting it to a power outlet, or by using a 9 volt battery that is installed inside the handle. I generally prefer using the static king connected to the power outlet, as it gives a stronger static charge. However, for portability and getting into the hard to reach places on a layout, then the battery is perfect. To mix it up a little, I decided to use my homemade static grass applicator to apply some of the 2mm grass around some of the longer grass to add a bit of variety. It's no secret that one of my favourite ground coverings to use is dried leaves that get blended and sifted into a fine grade. I also supplement the leaves with a variety of Woodland Scenics foams to add small bushes and weeds on the surface. The leaves get sprinkled over most of the area around the grass, as well as directly over the grass as well to add more texture. You may need to use a brush to help bed in some of the leaves so they don't sit up on top of the grass fibres. I make sure to remove any material from unwanted areas, like along the footpath or the road. This layer of leaves and ground foam will also need fixing down. Now for the final time I mask the road surface and lightly mist alcohol over the scenery, followed with some scenic glue to hold it all in place. Now we can start adding some of the finer details. Road signs are made in a similar way to previous tutorials, however this time instead of printing on photo paper, I printed the signs onto white decal paper and transferred them onto 0.5mm styrene sheet. They are then cut out, painted silver on the back 
and installed into the scenery. I'll have a separate video on this coming soon. Temporary chain link fencing is installed around the building site. I have a previous tutorial on the method for making this fence. There is a link in the description. The main difference here is that each fence panel is separate and I 3D printed the concrete blocks that were painted using yellow ochre. Other details for the construction site were also 3D printed like these pallets, the oil drums, the cinder blocks and even the portable work lights were all 3D printed. On the street corner I also have a few 3D printed details like the fire hydrant, post box and dumpster. All the files will be available to download on my website and there's also a link in the description. The foam booth was made using a combination of techniques. The main shell of the booth including the lower mesh screen panel was photo etched from brass. I have a photo etching tutorial that describes the process in detail from start to finish so you too can make awesome photo etched details at home. It's a lengthy process with many steps however getting ultra fine detail like the mesh screen is hard to get using any other method. Even resin 3D printing can't get detail that fine. Other details on the phone booth like the roof and the actual phone handset were 3D printed. The files for the 3D printed elements can be found on my website and also the Corel Draw image file for photo etching the main structure will also be available on the website as well for those of you who are interested in trying this yourself. Power poles are another important detail. I made these using 5mm dowel. The stems are roughly carved to introduce some irregularity into the pole and then lightly sanded to remove some of the harsh lines left behind from the knife. This diorama is in HO scale, so I cut the poles to a length of roughly 13 centimeters. The cross beams are scale 4x8 strip wood, which is cut to size. I opted for a small beam up the top and a slightly larger one below, which matched the photo I was using for reference. The wood is then dyed using some black and tan shoe dye that is mixed with isopropyl alcohol. For a cup of alcohol, you'll only need a few drops of shoe dye. The cross beams turned out great, however the dowel poles didn't look so great. So after using the dye, I ended up painting them with a grey acrylic paint and then a final dry brush of off-white. In the end, the poles ended up about the same colour as the cross beams that were dyed using the shoe polish. The cross beams are glued on with Helmar SuperTac glue trying to be very careful in getting them to be perfectly centered. Using the cutting mat grid was actually very helpful for doing this. The high voltage wire insulators were 3D printed on the Anycubic Photon and fixed in position with super glue. And the transformer that sits just below the cross beams was also 3D printed and glued in position with super glue. The wires running from the transformer up to the insulators was added using very thin lead wire. This stuff works great as it holds its shape which is perfect for this type of application. All it needed was a small drop of super glue to hold it in position. Just be gentle though as the wire is only 0.2mm thick and breaks very easily. An installation wire was added at the bottom of each pole making it much easier to install it into the seam. High voltage wire between each post is optional depending on the layout. They can be very fragile, so I will usually leave them till the very last thing that I do. These trees are Backman 8 inch maple trees. And as they are, they look okay. However, I wasn't entirely happy with the visible twisted wire trunk, so I made some improvements. The first order of business was to remove all of the foliage. Once the bulk of the foam was removed, I set the tree on fire. This actually helps remove the rest of the foam that is stuck in the glue and burns away the polyfiber strands leaving behind the skeleton of the tree. To hide the twisted wire I make a bark mixture. This comprises of some wood glue, some modeling paste and some very fine sawdust I collected from the small bag attached to my sander. It gets coloured using a mixture of brown, grey and cream colours until I get the desired bark colour. It starts off very thick, so a small amount of water is added to make it slightly thinner 
but not too thin as we want this to build up in thick layers over the trunk. As the mixture begins to dry, you can drag the brush over the trunk, creating a rough bark texture. To reapply foliage, I'm using Heki Seamoss. The excess wire is trimmed away from the branches, leaving a shorter stump. To make application of the branches much easier, I'm using some Hobby Tack Adhesive from Woodland Scenics, and after it has been applied, it's left for 30 minutes until the glue becomes very tacky. While the glue is drying, I prepare the small branches. When it's time to apply the branches, they simply press onto the tacky glue that was applied earlier. It should be enough to hold the branches in position, however as an added measure, after the branches have been applied, I also put a small drop of super glue for added strength. Where I live it can get very hot and humid, and sometimes the hobby tack adhesive alone is not enough to hold the branches over time. The branches are further blended in with the trunk by spraying them with burnt umber. To match the Australian environment, I'm adding the burnt grass coarse foam colour. When spraying the tree with the adhesive, try to avoid getting the adhesive on the centre section of the trunk. The foam is then pressed into the branches. I ended up applying two layers of foam to build up the volume of the tree. By adding more or less foam layers, you'll be left with a more or less dense foliage. The final detail is added with knock medium green leaves. This is applied in the same fashion as the foam layer. A final overspray with matte varnish is applied to remove the tackiness left behind from the spray adhesive. Installation is straightforward, just bore a hole, add some glue and press the tree into position. Don't forget to add some leaves around the base of the trunk to help hide any gaps and glue them down as well. Smaller shrubs are added with a new product from Woodland Scenics called Briar Patch. I really like the brown colour for the Australian scenery. It's very similar to the fine leaf foliage, however it's got a much denser application of foliage applied. The desired amount is simply torn free and glued in the desired spot. Other smaller trees are added by applying knock leaves directly over the hecky sea moss and added to the scene as desired. Now we're getting close to the end. The corner store is finally glued in place, making sure to push the wires through which are also connected once the glue is firmly holding the store in position. A small amount of water is added in the drainage ditch by first creating a dam using masking tape and as an added measure I run a bead of wood glue around the edge of the tape just to make sure it holds. The resin I'm using is Envirotex Light. It's super easy to use and can be coloured with water-based acrylic paint. It gets mixed in a one-to-one -one ratio. The colour I added was one drop of the Woodland Scenics Murky Brown and two drops of Yellow Ochre. Just try to avoid adding too much of the acrylic paint as it will result in a rubbery surface once the resin cures. Two or three drops for this much of resin is about the limit. As for bubbles, they are removed using a small soldering torch. Unlike the tree however, we don't want to set the scenery on fire, so avoid holding it too close in one spot for too long. The small lip left behind along the tape can be trimmed with a sharp hobby knife. Small ripples are made using Mod Podge Gloss. It gets applied liberally over the resin surface and then an airbrush is used to create the ripple effect. The Mod Podge also dries quite fast, so again just work in small sections at a time. To give the diorama a nice finish, the edges are sanded to remove any bits of glue or plaster and it's painted black to help frame the scene. The very final detail to be added are the power pole wires. You can use a whole range of products for this like lead wire or string but for me I like to use the easy line. 
It's an elastic material that is very thin. It may even be a bit too thin for this scale, but I want the wires to blend in with the scenery and only be a very subtle effect. And we're done. The scene truly comes to life with the moving elements, and I really love the Magnarel system because it can be basically made to work with just about any HO or even N scale vehicle. Even this tiny forklift looks very cool running along the street, and not to mention the bike riders. I hope you enjoyed watching this very long and detailed tutorial, and I hope you managed to pick up a few tips and techniques along the way. If you like what I'm doing here on YouTube and you'd like to help support the channel, be sure to check out my Patreon page. Cheers and thanks for watching.